Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides for the lecture on the skin or the integumentary system. My name is Dr. Alita Partizadarso and I will walk you through this lecture and this recording. So what you can see here on this uh, on this slide is just uh, a few pictures of people doing stuff with their skin, right? Doing tattoo, putting on makeup, piercings, and then shaving. So just thought I'd put it there for fun. Second lecture, uh, a second slide has got the overview of this lecture. So we're going to start off with the uh, basics of the skin, including its uh, function and its structural overview, followed by the top most superficial layer of the skin, that's the epidermis, followed by a, a, a short discussion on the other two layers of the skin, the dermis and the hypodermis. Next, we're going to talk about the accessory structures that are um, associated with the skin, hair and nails and sweat glands, and then talk about some several different things connected with the uh, to do with the skin. So on that note, I'm going to start off with the function of the integumentary system. So the overall function of the integumentary system is that it protects your internal organs, it protects the rest of your body, and because it's the outermost layer of our body, it's in daily care and protection in order to maintain its health. In, in terms of its protective features, it stops microorganisms and other environmental factors from entering into our body. It protects us from wear and tear with contact with grit, microbes, and harmful chemicals. So we can, you know, even if it hurts our skin, um, for example, if bleach or acid were to um, drop on our skin, it would hurt our skin, but not the underlying structures. And um, our skin also protects us from UV, UV damage, um, which uh, UV radiation, so the sun, um, which then causes damage to the DNA structure of cells within our skin. Our skin also helps to provide uh, protection against water loss, against dehydration, so it keeps water in within our skin, um, and it also acts as, as our sensory organ. Right? We can we can feel um, when cold weather water is poured on our skin, when ice is held against our skin, when a when a um, insect lands on our skin, um, and so we can actually um, sense with our skin. It maintains, it helps to maintain temperature and electrolyte balance through the production of sweat and through our superficial uh, blood vessels. It's, um, it is involved in the synthesis of vitamin D and it also, our underlying layer, um, our deepest layer of skin, the hypothermis, also hi hypodermis, sorry, also helps to store fats to protect underlying structure as well as to provide insulation. So our um, integumentary system is composed of skin and its accessory um, organs. It can be divided into three main region regions. The most superficial or topmost layer is the epidermis. It's not um, it does not contain blood vessels because it's the epithelium layer. So most superficial is the thinnest and it's avascular. The one, the middle layer is called the dermis, right? Um, which has got a lot of blood vessels. So you can see the blood vessels through it right over here through the um, dermal layer and it contains various different components like sweat glands that are associated with skin function and then the next the deepest layer of the integumentary system is the hypo hypo means below or under so hypodermis means under dermis epi dermis means above dermis, right? So you can actually figure out the location based on the prefix of the terms. So you can see here the hypodermis also has got a lot of blood vessels over here, has got um, fat cells over here, right? Adipose tissue, um, 
and has got um, a lot of different um, underlying structures, is involved with um, the nervous system function of the uh, skin. The skin uh, overall, or the integumentary system, helps uh, communicates with the, with the brain via sensory, autonomic, and the sympathetic nervous systems. When we look at the topmost layer, that is the epidermis, what we can see here is that, as I said, it's avascularized, it's multiple layers, top layer is flat, so stratified uh, squamous, right? And it contains keratin, so it's considered keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. We've got two types of um, skin, thick skin, and thin skin. So you can see here thick skin, um, the epidermal layer is thicker than the epidermal layer of thin skin, right? So thick skin contains all five layers, including the stratum lucidum. You've got here the location of the uh, thick skin and its uh, function as well as its appearance. So we've got, um, you know, you've, uh, if, if you've seen any sort of cop shows or what have you, you can talk about fingerprints being unique and um, being used as an uh, identifying tool to identify who left fingerprints on whatever object um, was found at the crime scene. So that's thick skin. Thin skin? found in most other locations in the body. It has normal skin function, so the functions in the, in the previous slides, and it only contains four different types of layer because the fifth layer, the stratum lucidum, is absent. So thin skin found in most locations of our body, smooth with irregular grooves. When we look at the epidermis, um, we're next going to talk about the cells that are found within the epidermis. So you can see here there are five different cells found within the epidermis. Um, and you can see also here that you've got the five different layers. So I'm going to talk about the five different layers um, in the next slide, but in this slide, what I thought I'd do is talk about the cells that are found within the epidermis, right? So the first type of cell is the basal cells. that are located in the bottom or deepest um, layer of the epidermis. And the deepest layer of the epidermis we'll see in the next slide is called the stratum basal. Um, and basically the basal cells are stem cells that produce keratinocytes. The next type of cell are the keratinocytes, and these are the most common cells of the epidermis. So you can see here, these are all keratinocytes, right? Um, and so they're, f they're found in the other four layers of the epidermis. Right, so what happens is these keratinocytes are joined together. You can see the junctions here connecting the uh, um, keratinocytes of the um, epidermis. And what you can see here as the keratinocytes travel, because they're produced right in the bottom layer, and then over time they travel up and up and up, and you can see right where it reaches the stratum granulosum, it contains these granules, right? These dots, right? And we'll talk about what those dots contain in the next slide. The third type of cells are the Merkel cells, and the Merkel cells are uh, sensory, are involved in sensation. So they're involved in touch receptors, um, with touch receptors for sensory nerves and they're especially abundant in the hands and our feet and that's where our hands are very very sensitive to touch right that's why we can read braille that's why we can um, um, sense objects as we touch them with our hands and fingers and all that because of the abundance of Merkel cells in our hands and feet Fourth kind of cells are melanocytes. So again, sites refers to cell. Melano gives you an idea of 
its uh, function. So they produce melanin pigment. And the pigment melanin gives hair and skin its color. The pigment melanin also protects, protects the skin from UV damage from the sun. Right, And what you can see here is that the melanocytes um, are sort of located down the bottom, but they've got these um, processes or these dendrites which basically um, project um, superficially. And then the fifth cell, which is not shown here, is called the Langerhan cells or dendritic cells. And these are macrophages. Macrophages around the, uh, around the body are phagocytes, which destroy um, pathogens, uh, bacteria, foreign particles, as well as cells that are damaged. Right, so you can see here the location of the of the um, um, Langerhan cells is in the stratum spinosum. So they help kill things off before whatever it is can actually um, penetrate deeper um, beneath the epidermis. Next slide is the five different layers of the epidermis. So you can see here I've organized it in words from the deeper most layer to the most superficial, whereas obviously in the picture, the one on top is the most superficial and the one down below is the deepest layer. So starting from the bottom, we've got the stratum basal, also called the stratum uh, germin germinativum. And basically, it's a single layer stem cells that constantly produce new cells. So they, the new cells are produced over here. And then, as I said, they work its way um, superficially to the surface. Um, the stratum spinosum is the next layer up. And you can see here the cells kind of look spiny due to the presence of desmosomes here that connect one keratinocyte to another um, and the stratum spinosum is rich in RNA. Remember RNA is um, messenger RNA is used to produce protein and so the messenger RNA of that are found in keratinocytes in the stratum spinosum produce the protein keratin. As as the, as the keratinocytes progress superficially, what happens is the keratin gets packaged in these keratin granules and they give the cells in the stratum granulosum a granular um, appearance. And that's why it's called the stratum. Stratum means layer. Granulosum refers to the granules, right? To the rough kind of granules. And um, what happens is that as the cells die, because as the cells progress superficially, they get further and further away from the source of the blood vessels. So they kind of start to die and they start kind of start to um, dehydrate, right? So as the cells die, what happens is that you can see the cells become flatter and flatter in shape. And then the fourth layer um, up from the bottom is the stratum lucidum, which uh, lucid means um, transparent or easy to see through. Um, and so the stratum lucidum is only found in thick skin of the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, and digits, your fingers and toes. And then the most superficial layer, the topmost layer, is the stratum corneum. And over here, the cells are well and truly dead. Um, but because they are dead, what happens is the vesicles of keratin um, release keratin. And that keratin protein helps to provide uh, an extra layer of um, protection, right? So the stratum Corneum is exposed to the external environments um, with the help of keratin. And keratin helps to um, provide uh, waterproofing of the skin, right? So basically what happens is skin is um, continuously being uh, produced and replaced, and it takes about a period of four weeks for the uh, four keratinocytes to be formed at the basal layer 
and then make its way up to the stratum corneum in the most superficial layer. I'm next going to talk about another type of cell um, that are found that is found in the epidermis and that is the melanocytes, right? The melanocytes are cells that produce the pigment color pigment melanin. Um, as I said, melanin um, gives skin and hair um, their color. And what happened is the protein melanin is again um, packaged into vesicles um, called melanosomes. So you've got over here, um, uh, this is the melanocytes here in the blue. Um, produce melanin, which are um, packaged into melanosomes. And what happens is that melanosomes are released by the melanocytes and they travel to the keratinocytes because the keratinocytes are the most common cell in the epidermis. And what happens is that the uh, keratinocytes basically digest the melanosomes and release the melan the melanin um, uh, pigment, and what happens is then the melanin helps to protect the nucleus so that the nucleus of the keratinocytes are protected from UV damage. Funny thing is, melanocytes pr protect keratinocytes. Melanocytes don't necessarily protect themselves. So that's why we have skin cancer melanomas, right? So so skin cancers are melanomas um, because they're skin cancers of melanocytes. So too little melanin can cause DNA damage of epidermal cell and folic acid destruction. Too much melanin can reduce um, vitamin D production that is important in the um, absorption of um, of uh, um, calcium. So if you look at light skin versus um, dark skin over here, what you can see is dark skin, um, you've got the melanocytes over here, right, um, that, that produce melanin and melanosomes. And what you can see here is that there is a lot of melanosomes in darker skin that produces and releases the melanin pigment compared to light skin you can barely see the mel melanosomes and you can't really see the melanin in light colored skin right so whether your skin is dark or light depends on the activity level of your melanocytes and this is seen when we try to tan. So depending on what our, uh, our baseline skin tone is, um, what happens is exposure to our, of our skin to sunlight, to UV radiation, will increase the activity of our melanocytes, right? So we still have the same number of melanocytes, whether it's summer or winter whether we're, we've been out in the sun or been down in the basement. But what's different is that out in the sun, in the summer, our melanocytes get more active, right? It's not that our melanocytes are, uh, we have more melanocytes in the summer versus the winter. It's just that in the summer, in the sun, our melanocytes become more active. And because they become more active, they increase the um, amount of melanin produced. And so with melanin being a skin uh, color pigment, then if we produce more melanin, then our skin color will become darker, right? Um, if, and, and the melanin then helps to protect the uh, nucleus of our keratinocytes from UV um, damage. So you can see here um, three different examples of diff of people with different skin types, so Caucasian, Asian, and African American. And you can see how in each of these different skin types, the skin does darken with daily exposure to uh, sun. Um, it's just the relative 
darkness of the skin after seven days with Caucasian versus Asian versus African American skin, right? So our skin color is dependent on genetics, right? Whether we have lighter or darker color skin, it's also dependent on how much we're exposed to the skin, sun, sorry, as well as the amount of blood that flows through the skin. Tans do not last. So again, if you are tanner in the summer because you um, are out in the sun a lot more and you become lighter in the winter, um, tans don't last because the, the melanosomes are eventually uh, destroyed and the keratinocytes that contain the melanin is eventually um, sloughed off, is eventually replaced by newer keratinocytes coming up from the bottom. This slide expands a little bit more on the bottom two layer of the skin, that is the dermis that's found underneath the epidermis and the hypodermis that's found underneath the dermis layer. So when we look at the dermis, the location, it's found deep to the epidermis. It's got two different layers. So the papillary layer is um, the layer that's the more superficial layer over here. It attaches the dermis to the epidermis, whereas the reticular layer is much thicker and it provides, um, there's a lot of collagen fibers over here and it provides the skin with the elasticity and strength and structure that we associate with it. The third layer, which is the deeper layer, is the hypo under the dermis, hypodermis layer. And so it contains um, adipose tissue. It's well vascularized, contains a lot of blood vessels, um, and it helps to insulate and cushion the entire integumentary system. I'm going to talk next about the accessory structures or a couple of accessory structures um, that are found in the skin, hair and nails. So um, a hair, um, hair that's found in the skin um, consists of filaments that are filled with keratin growing out of the epi epidermis, right? Function of the skin is to protect, has a sensory input, so uh, people that have, got, that have got hairy skin can actually sense mosquitoes or other insects before they actually land on the skin surface. Um, but our hair also provide thermal regulation, right, as well as communication. So you've got here, um, as I said, you've got the hair root plexus senses movement, um, air movement or other environmental disturbances. And then we've got the uh, erector pili muscle over here that when it contracts actually makes the hair stand up on it right? Um, and then our nails are uh, made from densely packed dead keratinocytes and they grow outwards from the nail bed, right? This is as much detail as you need to know about the hair and the nails. And again, I know you've got different um, parts of the hair, but you don't need to know um, those for the purposes of this. And then um, a second accessory structure of the skin is are the sweat glands. And so the sweat glands are, are a type of merocrine, exocrine gland. So basically the, um, they produce the secretion sweat um, in secretory vesicles here. And the secretory vesicles then fuse with the plasma membrane to release the sweat secretions. Two types of sweat glands, um, um, sudiferous sweat glands, as well as sebaceous sweat glands. So in terms of the sudiferous sweat glands, you have ecrine sweat glands and apocrine sweat glands. And so they're slightly different, right? The more common ones is um, 
the ecrine sweat glands, so they're which are found in all over the body, mostly associated with hair follicles, whereas the apocrine sweat glands are found in densely hairy areas like the armpits or the genital regions. So they, the sudiferous uh, glands produce the watery sweat that we think of as sweat, and the purpose of that is to cool down the body. So we produce sweat when we're hot, um, right, um, in order to try to cool down the body. Second time of uh, sweat glands are sebaceous glands, and they are also associated with hair. So you can see here the sebaceous um, or oil gland is associated with the hair, and they help to lubricate both the skin and the hair. Um, sebum that's produced by the sebaceous gland has some antibacterial um, properties as well. And then I'm going to... Uh, finish off this lecture by going through um, some of other functions and connections of the integumentary system, starting with the connections with the nervous system. So, as I said, the skin has a lot of sensory functions, so it can detect sat touch, right, with the help of the Merkel cells. It can also detect deep pressure and vibration with the help of these other kinds of structures called the lamellar or Pacinian corpuscle. And you can see the lamellar or, or Pacinian um, um, corpuscle are located deeper within the integumentary system versus the Merkel cells that are located right on the bottom of the epidermis layer, right? So the lamellar senses deep vibration and pressure um, versus light touch from the Merkel cells. Um, and we've also got pain receptors called nociceptors as well as thermoreceptors that can detect either hot or curl or cold temperatures. So we've got two types of thermoreceptors, cold thermoreceptors and hot thermoreceptors. In terms of the motor function of the integumentary system, um, I talked about the erector pili muscle that's associated with hair. And so what you can see here when it's relaxed, what happens is hair then, you know, comes, emerges from the epidermis as, at an angle. But when the erector pili muscle is contracted, then the hair stands straight up and it causes, also causes a goose bump as well. Right, so um, this is uh, regulated by the sympathetic nervous system, um, as well as the goosebumps that come as part of thermoregulation. We also have um, sweat production to help thermoregulate, as well as um, the role of superficial blood vessels. So superficial means at the top. So superficial blood vessels lie just underneath the skin surface, right? Just underneath the skin surface. And what happens is that it responds to either hot external temperature or vigorous activity, like this guy jogging. What happens is that the superficial um, blood vessels become uh, larger, it dilates to allow more blood to go through, and that's why when um, we're um, hot, either because the outside temperature is hot or when we're running or indulging in any sort of physical activity, our skin appears red because we've got um, the superficial blood vessels becoming bigger to allow more blood to go through, and what happens when more blood goes through, the heat that's contained in the blood starts to dissipate, dissipate to cause heat loss through the skin. Right, and also you know that when we're we're uh, hot, we also produce um, um, sweat in order to try to bring um, body temperature back down to normal. When we're cold, on the other hand, what happens is that the um, the super blood superficial blood vessels contract or constrict to restrict blood flow to the skin. So you can see here. There's less blood going through the skin, and so it keeps our core body temperature um, um, 
it maintains a core body temperature, but it also can explain why when we're very cold, our skin becomes paler in comparison because there's less blood going through the superficial blood vessels. And then the last slide um, shows you how the skin is involved with the production of um, vitamin D, which is important for absorption of calcium. So you can see here, there's a lot of different, there's three different organs that are involved in the production of uh, vitamin D. You've got the skin, the liver, and the kidney. So the first step of vitamin D production um, is the, um, the exposure of the skin to um, sunlight. Um, and then what happens then is that um, once it's produced in the skin, it goes through the liver where it, it, it is transformed into a, the primary form of circulating vitamin D. And then from the liver, it goes to the kidney where it's activated. Right, so it involves these three organs. Another way of the body receiving vitamin D as well as product, producing it with these three organs is to actually um, ingest vitamin D via food or supplements. Right, vitamin D is important for calcium absorption and phosphorus which is again important for. Um, production and maintenance of healthy bones. Vitamin D is also important for general immunity and it may also help to prevent cancer. And on that note, I'm going to finish up. Thank you.